All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining. Um, this is the NU Saving Shapes webinar. Um, we're doing the public data set release for commercial 2023, uh, release one. Uh, my name is Chris Caradano with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Uh, listed below are my teammates on this project. You may hear from them in the Q&A session. Okay, a few quick notes on logistics. So we are recording the webinar. Uh, because of the large number of participants, everyone's going to be muted. Uh, please use the Q&A box to send us questions at any time during the uh, presentation. Some of those will be answered directly in the Q&A chat. Uh, some will be doing uh, a live session at the end, so be sure to check the Q&A chat to see if your question was answered there. Um, and then the webinar slides, webinar recording, and the full data set that we're releasing will be available next week. We'll announce this by email. Uh, before we get into it, there's going to be a few survey questions popping up, uh, just asking about who's joining us here today. Okay, thank you all for participating in that. Looks like our biggest attendee group is consultants. Um, more than half have used the Comstock data before and various attributes for data analysis. Okay, so first, like a lot of research, this is work is the culmination of several years of different research efforts. We want to make some acknowledgements. Um, the Comstock and ResDoc teams, the Open Studio and Energy Plus teams, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, Argonne National Laboratory, and of course, the U.S. Department of Energy. So our agenda for today, we're going to go over our approach to building stock energy modeling with Comstock. Um, changes since our last big data release, which was end use load profiles back in 2021 fall. Um, and then the end use saving shapes 2023 release one, um, how to access the data set, some next steps, and then uh, a Q&A. So for those who are not familiar, um, EULP and EUSS. So the end use load profiles project was a three year effort that we wrapped up in the fall of 2021. Uh, for both residential and commercial, we created a public data set for calibrated energy models of the U.S. commercial and residential building stock. This project is called End Use Saving Shapes, or EUSS, and it's follow-on work, and it adds the impact of several energy efficiency and electrification uh, scenarios or measures to the baseline stock model to understand the impact um, of implementing these kinds of scenarios. So the residential team in ResStock had a similar release for EUSS. Uh, this was presented back in September of 2022 uh, by Elena Present. I've linked to that here. So if you like the content you see uh, in today's webinar and you want the residential perspective, um, that's a good place to follow. And I believe they have um, more releases coming out in the near future. Uh, this presentation is specifically for the commercial EUSS 2023 release one. So uh, the goal of this work is to help cities, states, utilities, and other various stakeholders have the information and resources that they need to make informed decisions about their building stock. So asking some of the questions like, will electrification of buildings reduce carbon emissions in my city, uh, be feasible in my building stock, uh, overload the grid? So we're putting information in the hands of decision makers. Uh, these data sets provide a lot including building stock characterization, uh, when and how buildings use energy, both annually and at different time series intervals, um, impacts of energy efficiency and building electrification scenarios. And then it's also used in various ways, such as electrification planning, emissions analysis, uh, and decarbonization. So our approach to uh, stock modeling with Comstock uh, so we're just going over the workflow here of the Comstock tool. Uh, so we first describe the U.S. building stock quantitatively using the best available public data. And this allows us to have variation in building type, size, all sorts of different attributes, HVAC system, uh, to, ref uh, to reflect the variation of properties in the actual building stock. We then sample the description. Uh, so for Comstock, we have over 80 probability distributions of these various attributes. We then model the samples. Uh, so we create a representative set of 350,000 open studio energy models for the Comstock baseline. And then for the end use saving shapes project, we model changes to these samples. 
uh, things such as, like I mentioned before, energy efficiency measures, electrification scenarios, and so on. Uh, then we use our high performance computing system to simulate the models, process and publish the data set and apply scaling factors. So this just further illustrates a few more of the building characterization um, distributions that we have to inform Comstock models. Um, like I said, there's 80 or more in total of these. Um, some of the key data sources that contribute to these are shown to the right. Um, and then for a full list of them and how they contribute to Comstock, um, the link below will take you to Comstock documentation uh, and that will explain the acronyms as well. Um, so once again, the Comstock model properties are informed by these types of distributions in order to reflect the variety of properties in the building stock. Uh, and this just shows an example of some select Comstock building characteristic inputs for one Comstock model. Uh, so to the left, we see location and envelope basics. Uh, in the middle, we have heating and cooling and occupancy schedules. Um, to the right, we have different energy code parameters followed um, for different systems in the building. Um, that's going to drive some baseline uh, properties, such as for HVAC, for example, what the cooling efficiency of a unit might be, or whether in a, it has energy recovery or things of that nature. Okay, so then what does Comstock model? So we model 14 building types. They are shown to the left. Um, what we see in the middle is comparing these 14 building types um, to CBEX. So if we refer to CBEX data, the 14 building types that we do model in Comstock are below that uh, black box. Uh, and then what's in the black box is not represented in Comstock. And according to CBEX, this is about 36% of the stock building energy data. Um, so we can say from this, the Comstock models about 65% of commercial building energy usage in the United States. And just for ease, in this presentation, when I say the stock or the building stock, I'm referring to all of the buildings that Comstock does model. So this approximately 65%. Okay, and then so in the end, uh, the goal is to provide a public data set to serve a wide uh, set of use cases, applications, and audiences. Uh, a few quick notes. Um, so the Comstock model is continuously updated with new information, methods, QAQC procedures. Uh, we'll be releasing data sets every six months starting now. Uh, measures that we present are not intended to necessarily be comprehensive of a given technology. And as new data becomes available, um, these results can be updated. Uh, and then in this uh, presentation, we present result summaries, um, and these are intended to just be high level observations to introduce the data set. Uh, for more detailed conclusions, please watch for updates and other uh, publications that we release, uh, or feel free to explore the data set. Um, a few more notes, just comparing Comstock's energy usage to the CBEX um, survey data, which is another prevalent um, building stock energy resource. Um, Comstock is generally higher on electric heating energy and lower on gas heating energy. Um, this isn't to say that one is more accurate than another, um, especially since CBEX informs a lot of Comstock properties, uh, but we just want to do our due diligence and make you aware that there are some differences there. Um, comparisons will vary by building type, um, and our measure savings are relative to the Comstock baseline. Um, so stock total savings um, and impact are going to be sensitive to these baseline assumptions. Um, oh, and to the right here, um, we just show a plot of the Comstock site energy by fuel and end use. I'll be showing similar plots like this, comparing the baseline and measure um, performance later on in this presentation. But each color represents a major commercial building end use. Um, and then the different textures represent different fuel types. So for example, at the bottom in black, we have interior equipment for gas, which is solid and, uh, or sorry, electricity, which is solid and natural gas, which is that right hashed line. Okay, and just this week, we've released Comstock documentation, um, the first version. Um, the document serves as a guide and a resource to the methodology and assumptions behind the Comstock tool. So if you have questions about how we handle something in the Comstock baseline, where our assumptions come from, for example, how do we handle lighting power densities or cooling efficiencies or what have you, um, this document will serve as a great resource for those kinds of questions, and I've linked it uh, here. 
Okay, so changes since end use load profiles. Um, I mentioned this briefly before, but for anyone not familiar, this was a major three year calibration and validation process that we concluded in the fall of 2021. Um, we released a technical report that provided a lot of comparisons to other data sources um, for the Comstock baseline and the Reststock baseline. Um, we've made some improvements since then, which I've listed out in this blue box. Um, so just note that there have been changes since the EULP baseline um, data set was released for Comstock. Um, down below, we compare the end use load profiles um, baseline for Comstock versus the end use saving shapes baseline for Comstock. Um, for total energy usage by state. Um, they're largely pretty similar with a few differences. The intent of this is not to really go into those differences, um, but just note that there have been changes since that uh, technical report was released. Okay, so now we're gonna get into um, end use saving shapes, our commercial 2023 release where we talk about measures. Um, so as I've mentioned, the end-use load profiles project, uh, that describes how and when energy is used in the building stock today. The end-use saving shapes project is meant to describe how and when energy is used in different what-if scenarios, such as energy efficiency strategies um, or electrification. Uh, for this data release for EUSS 2023, um, release one for commercial, uh, we represent the building stock of 2018 using a 2018 actual meteorological year weather file or weather files. This is a summary of the measures that we have studied. We're gonna go over each of these individually, so don't worry too much about scouring this list, uh, but we have a few HVAC strategies, a lighting strategy, and then five architectural strategies. Um, do note though, the percent of stock floor area to the right, this is the percent of stock floor area that the measure is applicable to. Um, which should be considered when you're looking at stock level results. So for example, the first measure is applicable to gas furnace and electric resistance uh, rooftop units. The comp stock baseline has those serving about 45% of the stock floor area. So they're only applicable to that 45%. Okay, brief note on greenhouse gas emissions. We do um, present greenhouse gas emissions in the presentation today, and they are in the data set. Um, we have greenhouse gas emissions from electricity and different on-site um, combustion uh, fossil fuels. Uh, for electricity in the presentation, we're, we're showing three uh, grid electricity scenarios. There are more available in the data set. Um, this work doesn't imply any preference for a particular grid scenario or recommend one that you should use, but rather we present multiple so that you can make that choice. Um, but for the three that we're going over today, the first two in that table are from NREL's Cambium data set. Uh, the first is long run marginal emissions rate, high renewable energy cost. This assumes that in the next 15 years, uh, renewable energy will be projected to uh, be high cost. Uh, so there will be less of it on the grid and therefore electricity will uh, produce more emissions and then sort of the opposite for the low renewable energy cost scenario. Uh, and then the last one is EPA's E-Grid for the year 2021. Uh, the fossil fuel combustion on site is a little more straightforward. We use these conversion factors uh, shown below. Um, and just to reinforce, this is for on site fossil fuel combustion only. So that natural gas, that's not for like a natural gas power plant, that's, uh, that would be reflected in the grid scenarios above. And then the greenhouse gas emissions in the data set that we present represent equivalent CO2 emissions. Okay, I know there's a lot of words on this slide, but a few notes on heat pump modeling. So there is limited comprehensive heat pump performance maps that exist for detailed energy modeling. This does create some limitations in our understanding um, of heat pumps and operation in this work, although we do try to use the best um, data available. Um, heat pump modeling is sensitive to performance assumptions. Um, this will impact annual energy consumption and peak demand. Um, we do try to use the most informative data available and we document all of this. I will talk about the documentation um, in a coming slide, um, but we document all of our assumptions about heat pump operation and performance. These will impact results and we advise that you consider these assumptions when using the results uh, to make sure that they are appropriate for your use case. Um, and then assumptions for measures represent one of multiple possible approaches that you could take. Um, we intend for the measures to be reasonable, but they're not necessarily meant to be optimal or the recommended way to do things. Um, and we can uh, modify our assumptions as our understanding of the technologies improve. 
Okay, and then I mentioned before all of our documented assumptions. So we have comprehensive documentation available for each method. These are quite extensive and they go into far more detail than I'll be going over um, today. Um, they describe the modeling methodology, assumptions, relevant Comstock baseline features pertaining to the measure, uh, and some observations from results in QAQC and such. Um, so those are accessible at the link below on our Comstock document website. Um, a, few note, uh, a few notes on energy savings. So first, stock energy savings represents the energy weighted savings across the building stock, not just applicable buildings. And because these include non-applicable buildings, they don't necessarily represent the average savings that a building would experience um, for a given measure. Uh, although you can get individual building savings in the, the raw data set. Um, and then site energy savings we present as well. This represents the energy savings for resources on site. Um, we just want to caution that with electrification scenarios where we potentially switch between gas and electricity for heating, um, site energy savings do not necessarily correspond to source energy savings, um, operational cost, or avoided greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so just consider these other factors when appropriate when looking at site energy savings. Okay, so now we're gonna do the run through of our nine measures, starting with heat pump rooftop units. So the concept here is to replace gas furnace and electric resistance RTUs with heat pump RTUs. Um, we're modeling these as pretty top of the line units, variable speed compressor and fan, high efficiency. Um, I have some performance metrics listed here. Um, so for sizing the heat pump, we're sizing the heat pump compressor to the design cooling load. And then any heating load beyond that is gonna be met with a backup heater. This is not necessarily the only way that you could do this. You could size to more of that heating load to get more heating out of the heat pump, but this does appear to be a common way to do it. Uh, for backup heating, we're using electric resistance. Um, you could use gas coil as well, but for this modeling, we're using electric resistance. Our compressor lockout temperature for this measure is zero degrees Fahrenheit. So if the temperature during the simulation falls below this temperature, um, the heat pump will no longer output heat and you will be relying completely on the electric resistance backup heat. Uh, defrost is reverse cycle. Uh, and then our performance data sources from this came from a mix of lab testing and manufacturer data. If you are interested in learning more about our performance curves and all these detailed assumptions, please visit the documentation. I go into that quite extensively. Uh, so for applicability, as I mentioned before, this one's applicable to about 45% of the building stock floor area. And then down below, this graphic is showing the energy code followed for the baseline Comstock RTUs, uh, which serves as our comparison point for savings for when we install these new um, RTUs. Um, so what we can see here is that the majority of Comstock RTUs follow older energy codes, um, with about 47% of the Comstock floor area with RTUs following our 1980 to 2004 code. Um, so this will drive things such as like the cooling efficiency of the baseline units, the fan power of the baseline units, and so on, um, which, like I said, will reflect um, energy savings when we install these more efficient units. Uh, now for savings. Um, so 42% heat and gas savings um, at the stock level. Uh, this is simply from electrifying the previously gas furnace systems. Um, negative 3% heating electricity system or, uh, savings. Uh, so this is a mixture between um, electrifying the gas units, which adds electric heat, um, but we are also saving some electric heat by converting previously electric resistance units to more efficient um, heat pump RTU units. Um, and then we have 16% cooling electricity savings. This is really a function of using these efficient variable speed compressors, which help our cooling as well. Uh, and 24% fan electricity savings uh, from using uh, more efficient fans, but also from uh, variable speed fans, which allows these units to essentially be single zone VAV systems. Um, the cooling and fan savings could also be attributed to a high performance non-heat pump RTU. Um, and then the savings for this is a, uh, associated with pretty top of the line premium units. Um, so it's not necessarily meant to represent any heat pump RTU. Um, down below, we compare distributions of non-coincident winter peak for buildings that have gas RTUs in the Comstock baseline. Um, and then with the heat pump RTU measure where we replace those gas RTUs um, with the heat pump RTUs, 
Um, and we can see that the distribution does move to the right. So winter peak uh, maximum is uh, increasing for electricity. And we see 22% winter peak intensity increase for the median heat pump RTU model um, compared to the baseline gas RTU model. And I just wanna point out, this is for the gas RTUs. This does not include those electric resistance RTUs. Okay, and then I'll be showing a graphic like this for all of the measures. This is for annual greenhouse gas emissions in million metric tons. Uh, the first three columns are the different electricity grid scenarios that I explained earlier in the presentation. And the three columns to the right are our different on-site uh, fossil fuel combustion scenarios. Um, this, the numbers above each bar represent the savings or emissions avoided pertaining to that bar. And if you wanted the complete picture, you would choose one of the three electricity grid scenarios and combine that with all of the uh, co combustion fuel scenarios. So in this instance, we're seeing savings of about 6.7 to 7.6% for grid electricity. Um, this is due to a mix of savings from the cooling, um, from the fan energy, uh, from converting those electric resistance systems to the more efficient heat pumps, uh, but it also includes the um, additional emissions from electrifying some of the previous gas units, uh, but we do see net savings across all scenarios. And then we see about 17.4% savings for natural gas emissions. Okay, so dedicated outdoor air units or DOAS with mini split heat pumps. Uh, so the concept here is fairly similar to the last one. We are replacing gas, furnace, and electric resistance RTUs with a DOAS and a heat pump mini split for small commercial. We're defining small commercial as less than 20,000 square feet. Um, so this is just a different way to go about um, replacing an RTU where the DOAS could use the existing ductwork of the previous RTU, and then you could install these mini splits in the uh, spaces. Um, these are meant to be premium efficiency, top of the line units um, suitable for colder climates. I added some performance metrics in here. Um, and then we also add an energy recovery ventilator or a heat recovery ventilator to the DOAS systems based on climate. Um, so humid climates will get those ERVs as they handle um, latent heat exchange for humidity. And then drier climates will get these heat recovery ventilators. Uh, for performance metrics, these are once again, top of the line variable speed compressor and fan uh, systems. Um, for sizing, we're going up to 135% of the design cooling load in this instance. Um, the reason being is that mini splits do not always have backup heat built into them. So we're trying to use as much of the heat pump and as little electric resistance um, as possible here um, for this scenario. Um, we do model these with electric resistance backup. Um, the compressor lockout is negative 15 degrees Fahrenheit. This is one of the lower values that I could find um, for these type of units. Um, then we use a reverse cycle defrost and our performance data source comes from previous lab testing. Um, this one was applicable to about 11% of the stock floor area. And then in the bottom of right, this came from a, a different report, uh, but it illustrates um, what we have going on here. So on the top, we have the DOAS providing the required outdoor ventilation air for commercial systems. So this is 100% outdoor air system providing ventilation air only. And then in the bottom left, we have the decoupled heat pump um, cycling to maintain uh, thermostat set points, uh, which it can do when it's decoupled from the ventilation. So for savings, we see 2% heating electricity savings. Um, similar to the heat pump RTU, this is a mix between an electric penalty from switching from electrifying gas furnace units to electric, um, but also heating electricity savings from converting um, electric resistance units to higher efficiency heat pump units. Um, but in this one, we also get more heating savings from adding the energy recovery systems as well. Um, then we see 18% um, heating gas savings. That's just from electrifying those furnace systems. Um, and then 6% cooling electricity savings from using these high sear um, variable speed compressor heat pump mini splits. Um, the map down below shows the average annual model effective heating COP by state. So if you model the COPs uh, annually of all the heat pumps in a building, uh, and then you average all of those in a state, um, you get these numbers here. Um, our calculation, we include electricity due to supplemental heating and defrost. 
in this calculation. So the more supplemental heating you use, the more defrost energy you use, the lower this number is going to be. Uh, these numbers do not include supply fan energy. If you did include supply fan energy, it would reduce these numbers a bit. Um, the pattern is largely what we would expect. Warmer climates see higher COPs, colder climates see a little bit of a reduction in those COPs. And this makes sense. Heat pumps generally operate more efficiently in warmer temperatures. Um, but as a, for these variable speed systems specifically, they operate more efficiently at lower part load conditions, so at lower compressor speeds, um, which is more likely to happen in some of these warmer climates. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we're looking at about 2.5% savings across all the grid scenarios and about 7.4% savings for natural gas. Okay, uh, heat pump boiler. So the concept here is to replace natural gas boilers in the Comstock baseline um, that are used for space heating with air source heat pump boilers. Um, most boilers in the Comstock baseline use 180 degree um, Fahrenheit supply temperature um, to align with what heat pump boilers um, seem to be using these days. It's about 140 degrees, so that's what we used. And we do resize our coils to accommodate this. We've made the measure flexible so that we can study not doing so in the future to see how that affects building loads. But for this, we are resizing um, the coils to accommodate this lower temperature. Um, and then we add electric resistance boilers for backup when needed. Um, so for sizing, there were a few different ways that we saw um, how to do this for plant systems. Um, one of them was to choose a temperature and then make sure that the available heat pump capacity at that temperature could meet the design loads at that temperature. Uh, and 17 degrees was fairly common. So like the other ones, there's multiple ways that you can go about sizing. You can go more aggressive, um, but this is what we chose for this measure. Um, as we mentioned, electric uh, resistance boiler heat will be used whenever the heat pumps can't um, meet the loads on their own. Um, the compressor lockout for this one is negative five degrees. That just came from uh, manufacturer data. Uh, defrost is integrated into our performance curves and our performance data source was manufacturer data. Um, so this measure is applicable to about 18% of the stock floor area. And then the graphic below just shows how um, like I said, these are about 18% of the stock floor area for systems with boilers, but they do make up more like 50% of the baseline natural gas heating. Um, so even though they're only close to 20% of the stock floor area, they are about 50% of natural gas space heating in our baseline. which shed some light on our savings. So we see about 49% heating natural gas savings. This is simply from electrifying boilers that were previously natural gas. And then alternatively, we see negative 40% heating electricity savings. Unlike the other heat pump measures, we are not making previously electric resistance systems more efficient by switching them to heat pumps. We're only electrifying natural gas boilers. Um, so we do see more of that penalty coming through here. Um, and then the map here shows um, where the natural gas heating savings are coming from. I think the easiest way to explain this is uh, all of these numbers add up to 100. And then we can say that 6.3% of these natural gas heating savings are coming from California. About 15% are coming from New York, close to 9% um, in Illinois, and so on. Uh, and this is really just going to be driven by the prevalence of where natural gas boilers are uh, and their respective uh, gas usage. Uh, so emissions, uh, we do see an emissions increase in this measure across all grid scenarios uh, between 2.6 and 3.3% uh, or 10 to 12 million metric tons. Um, this is expected because we are just electrifying natural gas systems, but unlike the other measures, we're not saving electricity for cooling, we're not saving electricity for fans or any of that. So we do end up with between 10 and 12, depending on the grid scenario here, uh, million metric tons of additional emissions. Uh, however, we do show 20.4% natural gas emissions avoided, uh, or negative 15 million metric tons. Um, so for the whole picture, regardless of the grid scenario that um, you choose here, we do still end up with net emissions avoided. Okay, uh, switching gears a little bit, LED lighting. Um, so this measure is pretty simple. Any building in the Comstock baseline that does not have LED lighting will receive LED lighting. Um, this is applicable to about 65% of our stock floor area. 
Uh, the table to the right shows the percent stock floor area by lighting type uh, and by building type. So going across the top, we have T12 and incandescence, uh, T8 and halogens, T5 and compact fluorescence. Uh, then we have a generation four older LED and a generation five uh, newer LED. So this measure will replace all of the lighting in those first three columns with those generation five LEDs. And once again, that's about 65% of our stock floor area. Um, and then we have some information on here pertaining to where the baseline um, data came from for driving our technology distributions and our lighting power densities and so on. Uh, and we go into more detail on that in the documentation for the measure and also the Comstock documentation uh, at large. Uh, so for savings, we see about 48% electricity interior uh, lighting savings. Uh, we do see small changes in HVAC load. So lighting with higher power uh, emits heat to the space. Um, so when you reduce the lighting power through more efficient lighting, um, your cooling loads will decrease. So we see a reduction in cooling energy. Um, fan energy can decrease. Um, and then heating energy increases a little bit. Um, so that's expected. Uh, down below, we compare average um, site energy use intensity savings by building type and by the baseline lighting technology type. So the blue bars are our least efficient lighting, the T12s, then moving along, we have our T8s uh, in orange and our T5s in uh, red. And we can see that the least efficient lighting, uh, when we replace it, saves the most energy. That's probably not the most profound thing that you have heard all day, but this does put some, some values to that and what the increases are, which can be useful. Um, and then comparing different building types, um, this is really gonna be driven by the amount of lighting generally in each building type, as well as schedules and hours of operation uh, for the different building types. Uh, so then for emissions, we see about 6% grid emissions avoided across all the electricity scenarios and about a 2.13% uh, natural gas emissions increase due to that extra heating load or reduced heating load, I should say, um, from having the more efficient lighting in the space. But this is by and far outweighed by the uh, emissions avoided in the electricity grid scenarios. Okay, exterior wall insulation. Uh, so the next five of these are gonna be um, envelope measures. Um, so this measure adds rigid insulation under the exterior cladding outside of structural elements uh, for wall insulation. Um, and we do so to buildings in the baseline with mass steel frame or wood frame walls. So everything except for metal frame walls, which is applicable to about 98% of the stock floor area. Um, and we target performance values. So we're adding insulation to meet the values in this wall insulation performance table. Um, the targets are driven by climate zone. They range between our 13 and our 29, and they come from the Advanced Energy Design Guide or AEDG, as you'll see in this presentation. Um, to the right, we compare the change in distribution of wall R values between the Comstock baseline on the top um, and the exterior wall insulation measure on the bottom. And the key takeaway here is that the distribution were, uh, moves to the right. So we're adding quite a bit of wall insulation compared to the baseline stock. Uh, so for energy savings, we see 12% heating electricity savings, 10% heating gas savings, 3% uh, cooling electricity savings, um, and then 1% fan electricity savings. Uh, for this one, and really most of the envelope measures, um, the savings are driven by reducing your heating and cooling or HVAC loads. Um, and then for some of these, we do see increased cooling loads um, for some of our models. You'll see that in the data set, and we explain it more in the documentation. Um, and then down below at the bottom, we show stock site energy savings by building type. Um, so this is at the stock level, it's weighted. Um, and a lot of this is going to be driven really by the prevalence of that building type in the, in the building stock. So warehouses to the far right, um, those are showing the highest savings, uh, a lot of which because warehouses are our most prevalent building type in the building stock for Comstock. Okay, and then greenhouse gas emissions. So we show around 2% emissions avoided off the electricity grid for all the scenarios and about 4.2%. Um, for our natural gas on-site combustion. Okay, the next three measures are going to be different strategies for windows. So the first one, window films. 
Um, the concept is to add a window film to the existing window. Um, the film properties vary by climate and um, the existing baseline Comstock window type. Um, you can see the documentation for all the different property combinations that we used for this. Uh, but essentially it adds a low E coating and or reduced solar heat gain coefficient um, to the existing window. Um, the applicability is to all non-triple pane windows in the Comstock baseline, which is over 99% of the Comstock floor area. Um, in other words, there's not a lot of triple pane windows in the building stock. Uh, and this just compares the seasonal trade-off that we expect with reducing solar heat gain coefficient. Uh, to the left, we show electricity for space cooling. To the right, we show electricity used for space heating uh, by month. And the, the orange is the baseline, the Comstock baseline energy usage. And then the green is for the upgrade. Um, so to the left, we see reduced uh, cooling energy with the film product. And to the right, we see increased heating energy uh, with the film product, really just because we're blocking out some of our passive heat, um, which can be beneficial for cooling um, or um, increase heating energy by a bit. Um, so in the end for this one, we show 7% cooling electricity savings, 5% district cooling savings, 2% um, fan electricity savings and negative 7% heating uh, for both gas and electricity combined savings. Um, and there's a lot of variation in this between building type, baseline window type, uh, and climate zone that we explore more in the measured documentation, uh, but you'll also see if you explore in the data set. So for greenhouse gas, we show a little over 1% um, emissions avoided across the grid scenarios and about 2.6% um, increase for the natural gas. And that's once again from uh, increasing our heating load with the reduced solar heat gain coefficients. Okay, secondary windows. Um, so the concept here is to install a second window within the frame or reveal of an, uh, an existing window. And we illustrate that where the dark blue is the existing window. Um, and then to the left of that, we see where the secondary window sits. Um, we target total performance between our 1.6 and our 2.7. These, these targets are once again, based on the advanced energy design guide. Um, we assume no impact on infiltration, although there is some qualitative um, evidence against this. Um, and hitting these targets are limited by the existing frame performance. Um, so if you're using, for example, a single pane window, um, these inserts alone may not be enough to actually hit the targets. Um, for applicability, uh, like all the window measures, it's applicable to all non-triple pane windows, which is 99% of the stock floor area. And then we show the baseline window um, distribution by floor area for Comstock. So triple pane is that tiny little pink and red sliver at the top. Um, and then the rest are different combinations of double pane um, or single pane with low E or no low E, um, thermally broken frames or no thermally broken frames. Uh, and just to demonstrate the flexibility of the data set, you may look at this and say that this is a useful measure, but maybe it doesn't need to be applied to double pane low E thermally broken windows, uh, and you're not interested in seeing that in the results. So that's something that when you're in the data set, you can filter those out um, to the applicability that you want to show. And we'll go over the data set later, but I just wanted to demonstrate that functionality. Uh, so for savings, we show 3% across heating electricity, heating gas, and electricity uh, cooling, and then 1% electricity fans. Um, and we get, and these are due to reduced loads from increased window insulation and decreasing our solar heat gain coefficient. Um, like the other architectural measures, there's a complex relationship between building type, climate zone, the baseline, system type, and other factors. Uh, for emissions, we are looking around 1% for the grid scenarios and 1.4% avoided for the natural gas. Okay. And then a full window replacement. So this would be the most aggressive, from, at least from a cost standpoint. Um, so we're replacing the existing windows with those that align with the advanced energy design guide properties, which I show in the table below. Um, these vary by climate zone for maximum assembly U factor. So this includes the frame um, and maximum solar heat gain coefficient. Um, same applicability as the other measures. So I won't go over that again. Uh, but then to the right, we compare the distribution of average window U values in the Comstock baseline at the top versus this new window scenario at the bottom. 
and we can see that the U values shift um, largely lower. Um, and as a reminder, U value is the opposite of R value. So a lower U value means more insulative. And for savings, we see 5% heating electricity, 4% heating gas, and 4% cooling electricity savings uh, for similar reasons as the other window measures. Um, this one shows the highest greenhouse gas emissions avoided, closer to 2% for the grid scenarios and 1.7% uh, for the natural gas scenario. Okay, and then our last measure is roof insulation. Uh, so the concept here is to increase the roof insulation such that the total uh, assembly roof insulation value aligns with uh, properties in the Advanced Energy Design Guide. Um, those are shown below. Once again, these are by climate zone. So our targets are between our 21 and our 37 for the coldest climate zones. Um, applicability is just any building in the Comstock baseline that did not uh, meet these targets already. We add the uh, roof insulation for them to do so. Uh, and then another distribution comparison to the right, this time for the stock uh, roof R value distribution. Um, so we see the Comstock baseline at the top and then with the roof insulation measure applied on the bottom where we see a general increase in roof insulation uh, to align with those targets in that table there. Okay, and then we show 11% um, stock site uh, heating energy savings, that's combined gas and electric. Um, and 3% cooling energy savings um, just from decreasing our HVAC loads. And then down below, we show average EUI savings by building type. Um, one pattern that we observe here is that building types that are generally taller and narrower, so a lower amount of roof area for the floor area, um, generally show lower savings, so like large office, large hotels, um, and then buildings that are typically wider, lower, uh, fewer stories, more roof area given the floor area, um, seem to show higher savings like schools and retail. And greenhouse gas, we show uh, about 1.8% uh, greenhouse gas emissions avoided for the grid scenarios and 4.5% for natural gas. Phew. Okay, so that sums up the measures. Um, now we're going to switch gears and talk about accessing the data set. Um, so we have a few different formats for accessing the data set um, that we'll go over here and we'll talk about a little more in some coming slides, but this table summarizes it uh, pretty well. Um, we first have metadata, which is CSV and parquet files. Um, this does provide some results at the annual level only. Um, the groupings are just by individual building ID. So in the CSV file, you'll see a row for each building ID that we have. And then this includes uh, building input characteristics, energy consumption, energy savings, um, emissions, calculated fields, and so on. Um, and then I'll talk about the locations in uh, future slides, but this one is accessed through our uh, OD data lake and th these links are all clickable. Uh, so when we send out the slides, you'll be able to just click these links and go to these um, locations. Um, the next two are for um, time series data. The first or the second being individual building load profiles and the third being aggregate load profiles. Um, these are also in CSV and parquet files. Uh, the time scale is 15 minutes for these. Um, the individual building files are just individual building ID groupings. Um, the aggregate load profiles, so we have pre-aggregated files by geography, so we do climate zone, um, ISO region, or by state. Um, and the fields that you'll find here are in both of these are going to be energy consumption and energy savings. And those are also going to be by end use and by fuel type. Um, then we move over to the data viewer. Um, this, this is a dashboard um, with .csv exports. Um, the time scale is customizable. You can do annual or down to 15 minutes. Um, the groupings are also customizable and this will provide energy consumption and energy savings. Um, and you can access this through the link below for comstock.nrel.gov. Um, and then the full data set is available on an Amazon S3 bucket. Um, the time step can be either annual or 15 minute. The groupings are customizable. It includes all of the data in the data set for those fields. And you would access this through various uh, scripting languages. Uh, so now I'm gonna go over the field naming conventions. 
Um, anything in the data set with a prefix of in dot is going to be an input of a building characteristic or a geospatial code. So for example, we see in dot window type to the right. Um, out dot is simulation outputs. Calc dot is calculated values like totals or weighted savings or percent savings. Um, and then the weight, um, this is a value for scaling single model results to national scale values. Um, we get questions about this a lot. Um, so if you're looking at any value um, in the, for a sample, and it does not have weighted in the name, you would need to use this factor in order to get it to be representative of the national scale. Um, then we have the unique building ID. These building IDs hold true between the different data formats. Um, so the building ID in the time series data is going to match the metadata. Um, and that's how you would get more information on the time series data building IDs is by linking it to the metadata. Um, upgrade number, um, that will indicate the various upgrades we've gone over today with upgrade zero being the baseline. Um, and then model counts. Um, this is going to pertain to the pre-aggregated time series files. So if you choose aggregations by, say, the state level, this field will tell you how many models are included in that aggregation. Um, and then applicability for the different upgrades, true or false, indicating that the upgrade was applicable to that given um, model. Um, some of the columns for the out dots have the secondary level. Um, we have fuel type, so electricity, natural gas. Um, we have emissions, um, different model parameters and summary statistics, um, some quantities of interest, and then site energy includes all end uses um, or the site total energy. Um, some have a third source as well. So our results are often by fuel type and end use. Um, so our end uses being heating and cooling and such. So this means if you were looking at heating, there would be a column for heating electricity and heating gas uh, and heating propane, all as separate, um, separate columns. And last, anything with this double dot indicates um, that it, it's the start of a unit name. So for example, dot dot kwh per square foot. Uh, and we do have a data dictionary available uh, on our data lake or OD. Um, we tried to make these naming fairly intuitive so that you don't have to look up every single one of these. Uh, but if you do want a little more insight or a little clarification, uh, please visit the data dictionary. This shows an example metadata file. Once again, this is the file that has all the building characteristics and the annual results. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but it just calls out some of the different columns that we see like building ID or building type. Um, and that note that some of these columns, they don't have weighted in the name. So like in dot square footage, that is unweighted. Um, you would want to apply the weighting factor to that if you were trying to represent this at the national scale. Um, same with the peak KW and the annual natural gas consumption uh, to the right there. And this is an example of a time series file. So we show the building ID to the left, um, then we have our timestamps, and then we have all of our consumption values. Um, this summarizes some of our data set links. Um, so to the left, um, this is where you would access the Comstock data viewer down in that uh, blue button that has the orange um, around it to the left there. Then the Comstock documentation button will take you to our documentation website. Um, and then to the right, it shows where our published data sets are and where you can find the metadata and the pre-aggregations and all of that. And we, we have links to this down below. Um, this shows the OD folder structure um, where you can find these different time series files and, and all of the data that we listed as being on the open access data lake um, with the link below. Note that some of these links are duplicated across the slides. We just wanted to make them uh, to be in as many places as, as we could. Uh, and then we have our Comstock documentation website. Um, so this is where you will once again find all of the documentation for the measures, um, other useful resources. This will link you to the main Comstock baseline documentation, and we've linked that down here below too. Um, just more, more links, no new information here. This just summarizes um, links and what you can find at each one in a, in a different format. Um, and then a few reminders. So all time steps uh, are in Eastern Standard Time. Um, the metadata files provide the weighting factors for national scaling. Um, columns with weighted in the title already have the scaling factor applied. So we tried to get ahead of this and apply weighted um, values as much as possible where we thought um, useful. 
Uh, but just note these weighting factors exist and they need to be applied if you want national uh, weighted values. Uh, and then check your sample sizes on custom aggregation. So if you're filtering down the data set to like a specific county and then a specific building type and then a specific HVAC system, you can end up with very few samples. Um, and just based on data science principles, the fewer samples you have, um, you will increase your uncertainty. Uh, and then any column without dot that does not have a unit um, listed is in KWH. Okay, next steps. Um, so this is our list of proposed measures for the commercial EUSS 2023 um, release two. We're expecting to release this in September of 2023. Um, we have a few packages here, a few more HVAC scenarios. Um, we're gonna go to the Q&A now, but instead of leaving up this Q&A slide, I'm just gonna leave up this measure list um, for you all to look at. Um, so then Andrew Parker is going to um, lead the Q&A, so I will hand it over to him now. All right, Chris. Um, many of the comments or the questions that we've had in uh, the chat were answered in the chat. Um, there were a series of questions about the heat pump, uh, lockout temperature choices, and some of the stuff that uh, basically choice, uh, choices of assumptions in the heat pumps. Um, one of the questions is, why do you choose a, a compressor lockout of zero if the units are not rated below five degrees Fahrenheit? Um, uh, yeah, so the zero degree one for the heat pump RTU, um, that came from the operations manual of a heat pump RTU, and that was the default set point that they use. Um, so, and um, it was changeable in the operations manual down to negative 20. Um, so we use that because it was the default value for a heat pump RTU product. And I do, I, I do go into that and reference it in the documentation if you wanna see more about that. Yeah, that's a good point. All, a lot of these questions are answered in the documentation as well. Um, Another question that was related is the COPs that you're presenting uh, in that map. And just to clarify, those are annual average COPs. If you take all of the heating energy divided by um, all of the heating energy consumption or the other way around, correct? Yep, that's correct. And um, for heating energy or for electricity energy consumption, that includes the electricity due to the heat pump the electricity due to the supplemental heating, which is electric, and electricity due to running the compressor in the defrost reverse cycle mode. Um, so all of that is included in our COP calculations there. Sounds good. Um, one of the other questions was, does the heat pump RTU resemble cold climate heat pump RTUs that are available, e.g. from Aon? Um, I would not, I have not looked at that specific product. Um, a lot of my assumptions came from assumptions for the Dyke and Rebel, um, which seemed to be a pretty um, high-end heat pump RTU. Um, we do lay out all of the COP assumptions and such in, in performance maps and um, capacity degradation and all of that in the document. Um, so if you're trying to compare to a different unit, I would suggest looking at the documentation. Um, and seeing how it aligns with some of the performance metrics of the specific unit that you're interested in. Um, but one of the key um, notes is that the unit we are using is a variable speed compressor, um, which will add a lot of part load efficiency. Great. One of the questions is about the applicability logic between the DOAS mini split heat pump combination versus the heat pump RTU. It says, why is the DOAS heat pump only applicable to 11% of the stock and the heat pump RTU is uh, applicable to a much higher fraction of the stock? Yeah, and so the reason that we chose that is because the um, DOAS mini split measure, we're using small mini split systems. Um, so the intent is those are generally lower capacity. Um, and so they seemed more suitable for smaller um, applications. Um, we do plan to expand this, though, in the next round of measures, um, the second one on this list, actually, um, the DOAS with VRF, which we view as uh, 
system may be more suitable for large commercial applications. Um, so this will expand on uh, the intent of that measure. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's see, what heating system is assumed for the DOAS? Um, so we use an electric resistance um, coil in the DOAS, and then we have a DX um, cooling coil in there as well. Um, we used the um, ASHRAE DOAS um, guidelines for setting our um, temperature set points that the DOAS is releasing. I believe we do uh, 55 to 67, if I'm remembering correctly, but we do specify that in the, um, in the documents. You could alternatively use a heat pump for that system to make the electric heating more efficient. Um, we opted to keep this one simpler. Um, so we used electric resistance. Sounds good. All right, let's see what other questions have come in. Um, let's see. There were some comments on the, more comments on the lockout temperatures. Um, we'll follow up after this webinar with some specific people about to go into more details on those uh, as they requested. Um, Let's see. I think those are all of the questions that we would want to answer live. I'll type answers to a few of these remaining questions uh, in the chat. Okay. There is one suggestion, which is more time resolved data around GHD emissions, EVs, and DER integration would be helpful. Uh, for okay, assessing, yeah. yeah, so it's just a, a comment. Yeah, that's great feedback and really any other feedback that you all have on this, the format, um, any things that you think would be interesting for us to study in the future regarding commercial buildings, please let us know. Uh, so yeah, we appreciate that comment. Okay, and then there actually there is one more which I don't know the answer to, so I can't type it. For HVAC impacts for the LED lighting measure, did you model LED lighting heat transfer to the plenum instead of to the conditioned space? Hmm. That one I will have to follow back on, uh, follow back up on. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I can, I can distinctly see the field <laughs> uh, in open studio in my mind, but I, I can't recall what our values are for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's all of the questions that we are going to answer live, unless other people have more questions. Um, some of these questions that are coming in now are uh, really more like comments on future work, and please keep them coming. Yeah, um, please do. One question that actually was asked that I think is relevant is, are all of these measures considered readily available technology? Are there, are there barriers to adoption that are not counted, accounted for in the logic? Um, yeah, so we go more into where our assumptions come from in the documents. Our intent was to model um, things that are readily available. Um, so we were not necessarily trying to model future technologies. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I think the question about, or the second part is, are there barriers to adoption that are not accounted for in the logic? Yes, I mean, I'll, this, is, this is assuming overnight adoption of heat pump RTUs. If you really tried to buy heat pump RTUs for every single building in the United States all at the same time today, of course you couldn't do that, right? manufacturing capacity and product availability and stuff has to uh, ramp up to, to meet those changes. Um, and then there's, of course, design considerations, right? There may be design practices that engineers are not familiar with today. Those would be barriers to an adoption. But from a technology standpoint, we're trying to model things that you technically can do today. Okay, any more questions, Andrew? I think that 
is it for Hi, the questions. Andrew. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Andrew, there's a question that just came in in the chat. And it says, can this data set and models be used for city scale building modeling and analysis? Yeah, Andrew, Chris, I'll let you, you answer. Okay. Uh, I was gonna let you do it. <laughs> All right. Yes, uh, in some cases. So it depends. It depends on the size of the city you're trying to model and um the number of models that we have modeled in that city. So Comstock is not trying to represent each specific building in a given location. So you can't go in Comstock and find like a model for 123 Main Street and 124 Main Street and 125 Main Street. We don't have that. But if you take a look at the population of models and you filter down to let's say Denver, you're going to come up with a set of models that is going to be I don't know off the top of my head, a couple hundred models that represents the city of Denver. We're gonna release guidance for how many models we think is sufficient to represent um, a geography. And some, for, so if, you're, if you look at Denver and it's got a couple hundred, if you went and picked some smaller city or town somewhere in the middle of, let's say um, somewhere in the middle of Wyoming, we may only have a couple of models in that geography that you're talking about and so you have to look at the results and say well wait a minute do these make sense given that they only are represented by five models or something like that so the answer is yes but also you have to consider how you uh, what you're trying to actually get at but you're if it's not answering for this building, here's the savings. For that building, here's the savings. For some other specific building, here's the savings. It's a, it's a um, aggregate modeling tool. Okay, um, I see that we're after 12 now. Um, so as a reminder, we will send out um, the slides, um, the recording and the data set. Uh, we'll notify everyone by email next week um, and you'll have access to all of this. Um, and that's all I have. So thank you all for attending.